Okay. So our presentation is on the life and works of Henry La Bruce, and this presentation is by me and Sarah Mallon. Okay, so his name was full name is Pierre Francois, Francois Henry Le Brucier. He was born May 11th, 1801 in Paris, and then he died at the age of 74. Uh, as far as uh, education, uh, early education, he was enrolled at um, the College uh, Sainte Barbe, is it? Um, Sainte Barbe in uh, 1819 uh, when he was only 18 years old. Um, and uh, the famous Escol de Bra. De, de Beau Arts. They called it Beaux Arts. Okay, that, um, which is actually the School of Fine Arts. Um, and he also studied in Rome for five years where he developed um, uh, rationalism. He was one of the leading uh, fathers of uh, the new architectural um, uh, style and um, uh, thing uh, known as uh, rationalism, which we'll get to later, um, and he uh, he's well known for um, the relationships that he uh, formed between uh, iron and uh, concrete construction. Really, kind of uh, once again a forerunner uh, in that area. Um, during his early early career, he had initially apprenticed after his uh, second place prize winning for the initial uh, tour de Rome, and then in 1823 he apprenticed with Etrin Hippolyte. Godet, who was a French neoclassical architect, where they created the building that you see in the backdrop, which is the St. Pierre de Gros Caillou Parish in Paris. And as you can see, it really kind of plays into how he used his arcs and how he used his vaulted ceilings and everything. So you can really see how he started to design and where his focus was and where he was really going with the rest of his designs. So you can see further um, in his early career, um, there's actually a lot of um, re uh, recorded drawings, just early sketches uh, that are really amazing to, um, to have today. Uh, you can see some of his early uh, uh, just drawings and you can just see how uh, he, um, doing it, uh, it on paper can make it uh, look so 3D. Um, and uh, it, it's just amazing that um, people um, in that time period are able to do that. So you can see uh, some of those drawings there, uh, and he really focused on uh, proportion. So that was very important um, in, uh, for the Roman period. He, he took a lot of inspiration uh, from Roman architecture, from uh, Greek um, architecture as well, and it's a lot of focus on um, kind of the proportions between uh, the columns and just the width um, of uh, the building. Um, so the Prix de Rome was actually originally a French scholarship, but it was more for arts, not necessarily for architecture. So like the initial winners of this prize were actually like fine arts students and painters and sculptors. So it opened to architecture in 1720, and then in 1821, uh, Le Brussier initially entered the competition where he got second place award, and then he entered again in 1823 after his internship well, his apprenticeship, and then that's when he started his five-year education in Rome. The court in Cassation, which is the plan view you see next to his picture, is actually his winning, his uh, prize-winning design. And the, also the Prix de Rome, um, that involved him, him traveling to, uh, I think it was, um, nine different cities in Italy, so traveling all throughout there. Um, and uh, after he uh, actually won it, um, that is when he um, started his five-year education. So uh, talking about that study in Rome, uh, he's well known for this because his, his, uh, that short uh, five-year uh, period is when he developed a lot of uh, the things that he's really known for today. Um, so he developed kind of an architectural philosophy. Some may call it a philosophy, others may call it a style, um, but it's uh, this idea of uh, romantic rationalism. Um, so just to put it into layman's terms, um, it's really the idea that architecture can be developed, um, can kind of be formed from just a, uh, like a rationality, almost like um, take a need and uh, architecture is developed from it. But then you also have the second part, which we'll get on um, to later, um, known as uh, um, like uh, the bring onto light um, just kind of like the beauty of structure, and uh, and we'll, we'll you'll see a lot more of that when we look at his library designs. That um, you can actually get a lot of functionality from structural design, but you can also um, uh, have a lot of uh, beauty to be shown through it. Yeah. So the picture that's shown in the previous slide here, this bottom picture here, this is one of the. Uh, designs that he was actually tasked to do when he went on his Prix de Rome. So his like whole concept was that he wanted to map out 
individual structures and how they kind of played in with each other. And that kind of goes into his rationalism, like theories that each building had like its own way of being put together and then all buildings kind of had like their own utilitarian like design layout that was kind of uh, replicated throughout like Italian uh, early neoclassical Italian architecture. So if you've ever seen one of those books of, of form that you can just flip through and see all these different ideas to kind of drive inspiration, this was kind of like one of the first. So he wanted to map out all these different architectural um, parties. So moving on to his library design, this is really what he was, um, he was known for most. Um, and uh, this idea of a, a redefinition of architecture, something pretty um, bold um, that he wanted to accomplish with this. Um, so it includes exposed metal frame, uh, frameworks. Uh, that metal is um, iron, uh, cast iron. Um, just massive central spaces um, and uh, lightweight walls uh, on the exterior uh, and just a massive amount of brightness, really big windows. Is, uh, he felt like this should be uh, the center of what like an arbor and a library should look like. It should be like these large open spaces, uh, which we actually saw um, a very similar design, uh, one the, uh, the design uh, competition. Um, the specific design was very similar uh, to this and um, that's often uh, credited um, uh, partly to uh, Labrust for um, his kind of incorporate or his uh, um, his co contribution to uh, kind of the history of architecture, uh, and it shows how metal and concrete can work together, kind of in unison, and also just um, once again the exposed. Um, metal frameworks that uh, a lot of times before um, architects wanted to cover this up and he really wanted to show that it could be displayed and that it really can be beautiful. Uh, also this library that uh, is shown um, is the is the Sante Genevieve, Genevieve um, Library in Paris. Uh, so he grew up and, um, and he studied in Paris uh, and this is really where he wanted to um, practice much of his architecture. Okay. So this particular building is the only building that he actually completely designed and brought to fruition. The only other project he was on was a individual reading library space. Mm -hmm. So this building is really kind of like his brainchild. So as you can see that there was actually this very oblong structure to the building, mm -hmm. which was definitely different for that day. So this is why like he really stood out from all the other architectures of his time period. Um, so this is his library design. He actually only did the reading room in this building, which is the, uh, the National Library in Paris. So this uh, work should, it really reflected social beliefs and that the fact that it had like a very organic forms that not necessarily that it, the building itself was organic, it's that each of the individual building phases were shown in his end product, which was definitely different for that time period, so that's why he really left an impact on the 19th century architecture. Um, again, this is just his earlier reading room. This is built directly after his last building, the Genevieve, ended completion. And you can really see in his arch designs and the domes on top that he really lets a lot of natural light in to allow people to really use that natural light in their reading. And it's really brought into the facility a lot more. Um, so we've talked a lot about structure, uh, and just to emphasize that, because that was a really big part of, um, of what he uh, pushed for, um, is that once again he emphasized the use of exposed uh, iron frame construction, and he really encouraged uh, the, this, uh, this new movement of this structural creativity. Um, uh, a lot of us in the studio are now talking about structure and how uh, it doesn't have to be hidden, how it can really be shown. And you can see here in this uh, picture in the upper um, right is, is just kind of this amazing uh, um, structural element um, that he really got creative with um, and he, he really um, was a, a forerunner once again uh, for future architects to do the same thing. Uh, and this influenced the development of stronger, uh, lighter material. Um, eventually this uh, iron frame construction kind of turned into steel. Um, another one of these big things that he used in all of his designs are these large columns that kind of bring up into the ceiling and they really don't have like a colonnade head as much as that they kind of are used directly for structure, not necessarily only for like grandeur design. So the columns are a lot of reinforced masonry or iron or a combination of the two which is also not as seen in that day. So it was like a forerunner again of this mixture of materials and this bringing together of two very different materials. Um, this allowed for like very large spaces and then he did a lot of different detailing work in his columns.
So as you'll see, there's a lot of like very minute details in his framework, not only in his ironwork, but also in his concrete and stonework. Once again, uh, looking at uh, some of his drawings, we saw a few of them earlier, but they're just very, very uh, complicated um, pieces uh, and uh, really incredible to stand on their own. Um, and uh, uh, well, uh, used mixed media, um, very uh, accomplished in, in that area. Um, one of the, the first to really be successful with that uh, and uh, noted for his intricate um, line work too. You can see in the picture uh, in the um, top half of the slide. Um, just how detailed this was. These would, these would be massive drawings and he would just put hours and hours and days um, even into it. Yeah, the lower picture is actually a picture that he drew while he was in Rome on his Prix de Rome. And it's actually on top of a, uh, not a cast tape, but what is the very Yes, but a mausoleum, yes. <laughs> so he actually did a lot of these individual uh, mausoleum drawings which actually had like a lot of this intricate design work. So it's very interesting that he captured a lot of that in his early drawings. Um, the Boston Public Library is actually uh, directly based off of one of Bruce's design. It was not built by him, but it was actually completed and opened in 1895, and it was built by the McKim, Mead, and White firm, and it was in, it's currently open in Boston, Massachusetts. So this library, as you can see, has like the very large vaulted ceilings that kind of play into the Roustier's design, as well as the structure being open where you can see all the columns and how they flow down into the rest of the building, as well as having like this long hallway to this type of style that um, plays into his uh, large, long, rectangular buildings that you saw earlier in the St. Genevieve. Uh, this is uh, um, something I mentioned earlier. So this is um, structure brought to light, and this is actually a display um, at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York City. Uh, and this was really a big deal because it was the first solo uh, at, um, exhibition in the United States, and this was, uh, took place in 2013 that it opened. Um, and it was kind of known as, uh, um, be, and the reason why it's there is because his work was known as the milestone in modern evolution of architecture. Um, and this composed of over 200 of his works, uh, and and it included uh, tons of different things, uh, such as um, his watercolors, sketches, uh, uh, photography, uh, and his models. Um, and uh, um, just very interesting because it focused, uh, you can see this model. I was going to include the video, um, but that would, um, it was a, a long video. But it's just really interesting how it kind of uh, looks around this model uh, that he created that um, just represents the structure of this uh, project that he, uh, he worked on and also the incorporation of light uh, kind of um, Kind of emulating outside uh, out of the roofs that you can see from the exterior pretty amazing uh, model here um, and really uh, once again the idea that you can have just this beauty and structure um, and uh, have just a massive amount of light um, come into spaces and kind of light that up and illuminate it so to, uh, to conclude, uh, we have a synopsis, which is really just all the points that uh, should pop into your head when you hear Henri uh, Labrouste. Um, it's that Henri Labrouste was, he was a famous French architect, uh, one of the uh, forerunners, the fathers of the rationalist movement. Um, he's recognized for use of iron frame uh, construction, uh, and he's mostly known for his uh, famous library designs. And finally, uh, that he um, was one of the lead contributors um, in uh, the movement toward uh, kind of a modernist architecture movement. So, and that concludes our presentation.